It's showtime. We're the theater people in the room. <laughs> I think we're the only two. Uh, I'm Steve Cosson, and... I'm Michael Freeman. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about this uh, play of ours called uh, The Great Immensity. And we developed the, the play uh, through, uh, through research in, in, out in the world, in Panama, in Canada. But uh, a lot, most of the time was spent here at Princeton. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of that. We're going to show, show you some stuff from the play. We're going to get into some of the deep ideas of it, hopefully in an intelligent way. Um, so, uh, yeah, and we were Baron Fellows. Um, we spent a semester here in PEI, followed by a semester in the Lewis Art Center. So we were, we were quite literally a, a bridge between the arts and environmental science, um, and a very happy bridge, indeed. So um, I, what I'm going to start with is just uh, a quick overview of everything we did with a little PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so uh, this is our play, The Great Immensity. Um, the, the title, actually, Michael, do you want to explain? Yeah, because um, it was your it's idea. It's sort of great because we were yesterday talking about narratives and specifically metaphor. Uh, and uh, when you're making a, a play, any kind of drama, of course, uh, especially when it's derived from real life, uh, exploration to real life, and in this case from interviews uh, and science, uh, we were searching for sort of the metaphors that would draw it, that would make it into sort of a dramatic form. And we arrived at Barrow, Colorado, where the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute is located, and where, as you can see, at the same time, sort of a super highway of the international global, of the global economy is coming by and more of these massive container ships. So you're here with scientists on this small island doing incredibly intricate research uh, into uh, the environment, while at the same time, you know, as I joked, uh, container ships full of, you know, braziers from China are coming through the Panama Canal. And on our first day there, we saw a ship that is called from China called the Great Immensity, which, um, First of all, it's a wonderfully redundant uh, term, but also we thought was sort of in trying to figure out uh, what the scientists we were talking uh, to were doing. It seemed a great way of talking about uh, research into environmental science, which is it's the great immensity. It's so big that you need about nine words of how big it actually is. So we, enjoyed, we ended up using this boat, the name of this boat, as the title for our show. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, actually, just a little bit about uh, the Civilians, which is the, the theater company that I founded about 11 years ago. Um, I'm the artistic director. Uh, Michael's an associate artist and sort of our house composer. Um, we work together a lot. Uh, and sometimes I write. Uh, I, often, I also direct. Uh, sometimes we write together. Um, but the, the Civilians specializes in what I call investigative theater, which is new work created from creative investigations into the most vital questions of the present. And we've done work on all sorts of subjects ranging from the evangelical Christian movement in Colorado Springs uh, to the adult entertainment industry in the San Fernando Valley, uh, which you'll have to trust me, brings up all sorts of important vital questions. Uh, and the, I, the idea of the way we work this idea of investigative theater is that we, we support artists um, to go outside of their own experience and to engage with new subject matter firsthand. Uh, so that can mean travel, uh, interviewing, uh, creative forms of research, uh, anything that can help the writers to forge new ground and make theater about subjects that are otherwise underrepresented and such as climate change, um, or for the most part, anything about the environment, which uh, is profoundly a profoundly underexplored subject in the American theater, which I'll talk a little bit about why later. Um, so um, that brings us to the great immensity. Uh, and the project, this, this, this idea began, began actually a long time ago um, when uh, I got a little money to to try to write a play about time, uh, which is a, just sort of too abstract for me. Um, so I was trying to figure out my way into the, into the question of time and what about time was important to me. And I uh, specifically started thinking about the, 
the stark contrast between the time scale of natural systems uh, versus our culturally constructed understanding of time. Um, maybe a shorthand for that is, you know, for in, in my day-to-day -day life or as I imagine myself into the future, um, that is a much tinier sphere than what we now call the great immensity, the planet, um, geologic time, uh, sort of the normal cycles, what should be the normal cycles of climate, climate change. Um, so our, our small versus that, that big. Um, and, uh, and in a sense, you know, this very, this very, very peculiar time we're living in, in which we, we can uh, cause such radical transformation of natural systems. We can accelerate change in, in the planet at an unprecedented rate. I mean, possibly, I, and actually I'm not a geologist, so don't listen to the science, but you know, at least um, from my, um, my, artist, my artist side, you know, what we're able to do in a way kind of parallels a great big asteroid hitting the Earth and rapidly changing things for the dinosaurs. Um, so we have that technological ability, and I think on the cultural side, um, you know, just looking at our, our, our social discourse, how we see ourselves in the world, our epistemology, everything that, that frames our worldview, and we're very limited in our ability to actually assimilate what we are capable of doing uh, to the world. Um, so I was really interested in that gap, and uh, I honestly had no idea how to go about investigating it. Um, but that's one of the gifts of this theater company I created, is uh, it allows us the means to leap into what we don't know. Um, so I started with one thing I did know, uh, which was um, Barrow, Colorado Island, which um, if you don't know, I, think, I believe Princeton takes students there, um, Steve Piccolo goes there. Um, it's a research island in the middle of the Panama Canal. Uh, I went there when I was 16 as a uh, bird banding uh, volunteer because uh, not only was I a theater geek, I was a bird geek, um, which is a, a, a recipe for success and popularity in life. Um, and I knew, uh, I knew our Colorado Island was, a, was an amazing place. It was a, it was a transformative uh, experience for me when I was there, when I was a kid. Um, I knew that um, we wanted to talk to scientists um, in a different kind of environment. And I knew they would be captive and trapped there and have, and have no way to escape us. Um, so I took Michael, um, and then the back of this gentleman's head is a, a guy named Dave Ford, who's a filmmaker. And the three of us um, went to BCI, uh, interviewed science, followed them around, uh, asked them about worldview stuff. We'll get into that a little bit later. And this is proof that we were actually there. So. That's me in a very big tree. And that's Michael um, in the jungle. Uh, this is a sloth who's so cute. Um, and I don't know if he counts as charismatic megafauna because he's, he's maybe charismatic medium fauna, um, but very charismatic. And um, we'll see more of him later too. Uh, so after, um, after Churchill, we, no, after I mean, after Colorado, I, sorry, after Bar Colorado Island, um, sometime later, we went to Churchill, Canada. Uh, it seemed like a good idea. We still had no idea what we were doing, but Churchill is the polar bear capital of the world, and one of its main sources of income is polar bear tourism. Uh, another source of income is uh, its port, which is one of the only Arctic ports in the Western Hemisphere perhaps the only one. And because of climate change, the polar bears are dying. So the polar bear tourism is going to go away in Churchill um, relatively soon, I'm afraid. And at the same time, there's capital flowing into the port in anticipation of the shipping routes over the North Pole uh, opening up. So um, it was an interesting place, we thought, to go talk to people about climate change. And there's also a, a a research center there, so we, we interviewed both scientists and, um, and people in the town of Churchill. Uh, and again, the king, the king of charismatic megafauna, 
We went early in bear season, so there was only one bear to see, but that's it. That's the bear we saw. And following that research time, we came to Princeton to figure it all out. Um, and, and thank you, Princeton, and thank you um, for the Barron Fellowship, because um, without that, I think we, we might have stayed confused and lost for a very long time, um, because it is difficult stuff to figure out how to make theater about it. So we were, as I mentioned, in residence um, at PEI, followed by a semester in the Lewis Arts Center under the Atelier program, where Michael and I taught a class that was a kind of practical, uh, hands-on workshop with this play and also teaching the students how to create theater, to, create, to sort of work in different modes of communication about environmental issues and, and climate questions. And in that atelier program, we did a workshop of the play. It was still a bit of a mess at the time. Um, but we put it on stage over at the McCarter and shared it with the community here and got all sorts of valuable feedback um, from both the, the art side and the environmental study side. And we had our premiere production last year in Kansas City at the Kansas City Rec. And here's some production photos. These are actors pretending to be scientists who wear a lot of neutral colors. That's how you can tell they're scientists or, not, or um, environmental scientists. Um, you can see the show involved a lot of video. That, that, um, uh, that picture is actually we borrowed from one of the camera traps on, uh, on BCI um, when they managed to catch a jaguar walking around the island. And we do go to Canada as well in the show, like, uh, like we did in our research. And we, we, use, um, we use this one projection that we got from uh, the GFDL here in Princeton. And, and it was fascinating. It's, one of, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a graphic that essentially shows temperature change over time. It runs about a minute, and you essentially just watch the Earth heat up um, to the year 2100 where the, the dark red spots at the top of, of the globe show an increase of about 20 degrees average. And uh, it's sort of a testament to the power of theater, because whenever we show that, or people or do the play, and, um, it's one of the things that people comment on the most. And I imagine people have seen similar graphics in the New York Times, sitting by themselves, um, and assimilated it, but in a theater, it becomes real, I think, in a different way. And a lot of people who are, I think, you know, generally well-read people talk to us as if you know, they had no idea that the climate models were showing projections this severe. So um, that's just an interesting aside there. Uh, this is just a cool picture from the play and um, actors doing one of Michael's songs um, about ships. Uh, and yeah, and we will have our um, New York premiere next winter, um, about a year from now, which you are all invited to. Uh, one thing is we had, um, we were very lucky to get funding from the National Science Foundation under the category of informal science education. And they did, they did take heat in Congress for, for doing that, combining two of probably the most hated things for, well, three of the most hated things for Republican uh, the Republican Congress um, government, period, uh, climate change, and um, art, which is really <laughs> an, un an unholy trinity. Uh, so uh, with, that, with that funding, uh, we were able to do a lot more, lots of audience engagement programs, um, before the show, during the, during the runs, afterwards. Um, we've managed to extend the conversation of the play uh, through a lot of media projects that we did. Um, events over the course of every production, um, a website that I'm going to show you. Um, because it's NF NSF funded, you know, we've, we've had to do a lot of evaluation about the impact on the shows. We have a informal science education evaluation consultant who travels whenever we do the show and surveys the audience and quantifies exactly what happens. Um, you can read the report if you like to. Uh, 
And here's just one example of one of the activities we did when we had the show in Kansas City, which was a, a sort of local environmental fair that the theater organized and local groups sort of presented all sorts of things that were happening around uh, Kansas City. Um, so I wanted to show you next uh, this um, website, uh, which uh, is here. Yeah, so this is one of our, one of our sort of media engagement projects. It's a, it's a fairly interactive website that we developed to go along with the show. Uh, it's thegreatimmensity.org. And it's, uh, it's formatted as a blog, and the bloggers are the characters in the show. So if you, if you visit it, um, you'll see the, like two of the scientists um, we met on Barrow, Colorado Island. Oh, that didn't work out so well. Um, then turn into a char two, two characters who are a, a botanist, ecologist couple, and then they blog on, on certain issues. Uh, we have a bunch of videos in the website. Uh, one, of the, one of the characters in the show only appears on Skype. Uh, so, oh, that didn't turn out too well either. I'll just explain it to you. Uh, so, one of the things we did was a series of interviews via Skype with artists who are engaging the environment. Um, and there's a series of about seven of those. And then we also made a bunch of music videos of Michael's songs. So I'm going to share one of those with you now. Um, so this is a song. Should I just do a little explain what it is? Do you want to do that? Yeah. With our, so with our students, one of the great things about working with unbelievably smart and engaged students at Princeton is I got to steal everything from them for the show. And they have no rights over it. It's fantastic. <laughs> Um, no, one of the projects I had the students do was uh, they started just collecting in all sorts of media just statistics about how people feel about the environment. What was great was instead of really revealing anything about how people feel about the environment, it starts revealing how the media reports how people feel about the environment. And we made this into a song, which I call Margin of Error. And it's basically, well, you'll see, it, become, it starts fairly simply, and the statistics become more and more contradictory over the course of the song. And this video, using fruit, uh, illustrates the, the words of the song. The polls show 57% of Americans think something's happening to the climate. 91% think it's somewhat serious. 40% think it's somewhat important. 41% think that it's over-exaggerated. 21% think that it's under-exaggerated. 44% think that it should be more priority, but not if it costs too much and less than healthcare or the economy. 36% think it's caused by humans. Or maybe 47%. Or 51% maybe think it's a combination of human and natural causes. 50% favor regulation, 20% or maybe less or more seek action, 10% believe the snow they shoveled last winter precludes any chance of climate change, 20% aggressively reject catastrophic outcomes as a possibility, 60% six-point margin of error. Uh, so that, uh, that is margin of error. Um, so uh, we're going to talk just a little bit now about sort of our, our way into the environment and climate change. Um, and I, I promise Michael's going to talk too. I'm doing most of the talking at the beginning. Um, I will be talking. And he's going to sing. He's going to talk and sing. Uh, so, um, so for me, uh, as I said, you know, where this um, started, I was interested in this ever-widening gap uh, between what we're doing, capable of doing through technology and our advanced economic systems, and on the other hand, the uh, the cultural realm. And I think um, I think now cultural 
culture is mostly playing catch up in terms of the environment. Uh, I think some, some art, some culture can assimilate change more quickly, um, such as the visual arts, where there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff happening in terms of the environment and climate change. Um, but that which involves um, narrative, uh, which I do think of as kind of the substrate of social culture, uh, that evolves more slowly. And, and theater, especially in this country, I would argue evolves the slowest. And, and part of that is the extrinsic support structures of theater. Theater depends on the interests and appetites of philanthropists and the ticket buying public. Uh, theater tends to be risk adverse. I could talk more about that, but I won't right now. Uh, and I also think in theater, it is, um, it's both a generic and a, a formal problem. So um, in literature, for example, you have the genre of speculative fiction and a lot of environmental questions um, or ideas can, can slide into that, um, into that genre, whereas, whereas theater uh, is, is traditionally much more um, about the present. It examines the past off, you know, in, through the present, um, and it's about interpersonal. It's about interpersonal relationships. And, and we, don't, we don't consider environmental issues as critical components of the interpersonal, uh, which is wrong, of course, um, and kind of crazy, if you think of it, um, that we have evolved a kind of culture and system where we, where we can have that belief, um, but, but we do. Uh, and at the same time, I think, um, I think theater does have a tremendous potential to transform consciousness, uh, to dismantle those very illusions, uh, as it were, and manifest a different vision of our, of our shared social reality. Uh, part of that, I think, is because the, the fiction of theater is, is actually happening in front of you. I think your, your neurons, in a certain sense, believe that it is happening, because it is right there in, in real time. Uh, and part of it is that it is a shared social experience. You have to gather together to do it, much like uh, religion and ritual, which you heard about yesterday. Um, so that's a little context, I guess, for me. And um, so then personally, to start the project, I did a lot of reading. Um, and the more I read, uh, the more I felt in a very anxious way, uh, this growing certainty that we are hurtling towards a very grim future. Um, and uh, I felt that anxiety in a in a particularly paralyzing way, and maybe anxiety is always paralyzing, at least it is for me. Uh, so the question became, uh, how do I break out of that cycle? Because you know, even if it's true that we may be heading towards a particularly grim future, uh, anxiety and the suffering uh, born from anxiety is useless. You are essentially just running around the same territory like Paul's squirrel. Um, so that was my starting point. It was basically, how do I, how do I snap out of this? Um, because I'm not enjoying it. Um, and, uh, and I know that I am, I'm useless like this and I want it to be, to be useful. Um, and now I'll toss it over to Michael. Yeah, um, I, it's funny, last night, at, uh, last night at dinner I was saying that a lot of the projects that I have worked on in theater come from a, a bookshelf that is filled with books that I didn't read in college and it sits sort of on your bookshelf like a terrible reproach and then finally on a rainy day you might pull one out and say okay I'm finally going to read the thing that that professor when I was 19 years old told me to read and um, what I mean to say by that is uh, I, uh, I'm interested in the ways in which theater connects to other disciplines and um, often I wonder why theater can't do the work of, or at least collaborate with, history, with journalism, in this case with science, with environmental sciences. Um, uh, a complaint, uh, we, we sometimes hear about our work from, uh, from certain funders sometimes is, you know, this, this, this show feels like a history lesson, or this show feels like a thing. Well, if it feels like a history book, it, it doesn't feel like a bad history book, because you would never complain about a history book that it feels like a history book. So in a funny way, why does theater have to do this very small kind of job of, you know, we joke about it, the sort of two people on a couch play and their problems and their marriage. Uh, why can't theater uh, draw on uh, all sorts of disciplines and collaborate with those disciplines and use the dad perform yesterday when uh, Mary Evelyn and uh, John were talking about uh, 
religion, uh, the, the interaction of religion and ritual with the environment, I thought, you know, there's a secular world of, of uh, ritual in a room with people, which is theater. Theater is this sort of amazing moment when people, it's just like now, uh, people are all sitting in a room together and gathering together and interacting. In a sense, theater is the making of one society. It's not an audience. And it's a participa participatory, uh, engaged process. And so in, in dealing with questions of the environment, how do we create a, a world in which the audience and the performers and the creators and the scientists from whom we got these interviews and all this information can, in a sense, engage on one, in one narrative structure. So, um, then there's a question, but I write the songs. So where do songs come from? And the one thing that's, I, I just want to show you a couple songs that I've worked on. Um, two places we found the songs come from uh, in this show particularly are from the stories we were told. Uh, from just, uh, we heard so many wonderful stories and putting those, when you said those in songs, it kind of, I don't want to say puts them in quotation marks, but certainly sets them into re in relief, uh, shows them in a different way, makes you listen to it differently. Um, as you heard in that previous song, it also can make you listen to rather dry information in a different way, in maybe a more humorous way, but also in maybe a more critical way. Um, so the first one I want to sing to you is two different stories we heard. I became obsessed with the last living animals of every of all sorts of species, and therefore particularly obsessed with Martha, the last living passenger pigeon. Um, and then we heard a story from, in fact, the botanist couple that Steve was talking about, about an evening they spent in Africa listening to two lemurs calling each other. So this song is called Martha and the Last Lemur. Martha was a pigeon in the Cincinnati Zoo. The last survivor of celebrity too. Her family became the most common in the nation as disease from Europe swept the native human population. They were social birds and they preferred to mate in the crowd. Until Martha's last few years, their mass killing was allowed. In 1857, Congress gave the direction. This bird is so abundant that it needs no protection. Without a breaking group, the pigeons would not mate. And soon it was too late. They went from billions to just you. In the Cincinnati Zoo, the last wild male was shot by a boy with a gun, and so Martha was the only one, singing, oh, my love, my love, where have you gone? Oh, my love, my love, is there no one left to love?
And it does work great in a play, like once you throw that in, you, and it sort of sets up, okay, I know what's, what's at stake here and what the conflict is about and what our characters are up against. Um, uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, sort of how I figured out what the, what the story of the play was, and then you'll have to come see the play in New York to find out what the story is. Uh, so um, go, going back to BCI, um, which, um, which did, you know, was sort of the culmination of like a year of, of reading for, for both of us. Uh, we went around and, you know, just spent time with these scientists, learned about their research, followed them around in the jungle, um, asked them ridiculous, you know, asked them questions about their research, but also asked them ridiculous questions like, how do you get up out of bed in the morning knowing what you know? Uh, like for a while I was calling the show um, Steve versus Hope. It's true. Because Steve was on the side, so he really was like, knowing what you know, how do you get up in the morning? And it was amazing the people who actually provide Hope versus Steve, who often won. I almost always won. Um, <laughs> but what I was searching for was the hope. I was trying to figure out, you know, what, it, what, what is it, what, um, you know, in our, um, in our beliefs or in their beliefs um, does create hope and agency in a, a very difficult time. So, yeah, the strategy was, like, anything that they gave me, I'd try to take it down and see if they could come back with more. Um, and, you know, maybe one person succeeded. Uh, my favorite one was this um, Colombian paleontologist uh, who um, became a character in the show. And I was asking him, I think, uh, you know, where do you, what do you, what do you see happening when you imagine the future? Like, do you think humankind will survive? And he said, oh, no, I think, um, I think we'll probably go extinct in about 3,000 years, um, which is really remarkable, you know, and considering how how much time it normally takes a species to go extinct, and we're going out so fast, that's amazing. Um, with this, this little gleam in his eye. Uh, and I, was like, well, how, I said, well, how does it make you feel that we're going extinct in 3,000 years? And he said, well, um, happy. Really happy that I'm living now and not in the future. You know, it's going to be so much worse. You know, I think for me and for my kids, it'll probably be okay. For their kids, yeah, I don't know. So we should be really lucky. We're so lucky to be living right now, um, which um, you know is one way to look at it. Uh, but from all those conversations, uh, and and I think very much from also being in the rainforest, I, I think going into another environment really does transform your your thinking. And I left with with this really extraordinary expanded consciousness. Um, 
uh, it was, and it really was like some great big switch flipped in my head, and all this stuff which I believed in, which previously had been somewhat abstract or really just sort of too big for me to to really feel it and believe it in a very visceral way became real, like 100% real. Uh, and I mean, it's all perception, of course, but um, you know, you're talking to artists and humanities people and really everything is perception uh, when it comes to the mind. So perception is really what matters. And, and I had this, um, this sort of transformed perception. Of course, I wondered if it would last and it didn't. Um, and and I'm, I'm back in the way, in a way, um, back in sort of the scale of real life. But, uh, but I knew it was possible. Uh, and it made me realize that, you know, you know, maybe actually Bill, someone like Bill McKibben lives in that expanded consciousness like all the time. And maybe it's, I can get back there and maybe other people can, can, can get there. Um, and it really then became the question of the play. Um, so the question being like, if you, if, um, oh, and I'm sorry, and one, one side of that expanded consciousness was all this stuff that had always felt important to me, um, or I, I agreed with its importance, this human stuff just, just burned away and became totally inconsequential. Um, and, and I felt like I was living in the truth of the moment that we're in. That's sort of the, my best way to describe the, the consciousness. And so, yeah, so the question was, um, if, you, if your job was to then try to transform the world, all the people in the world, to um, that kind of consciousness and do it in a very short amount of time, relatively short amount of time, how would you figure out what to do and what would that be and would you do it? Um, and so in the play there's a group of people trying to do just that and then what they do is actually a really terrible idea. Um, which is on purpose, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but the fact that it's kind of a terrible idea is, is on purpose because what I want my audience to leave the audience um, feeling is uh, a new way of seeing, um, a deepening of, of the questions that they're asking. And I, I believe if you give them answers, then you, you actually limit the potential transformation. So I ask all these questions, Michael asks all these questions, we give them a provocative bad answer, which is really to say, you know, go, go forth and think. Um, what's next? So next, um, uh, we we maybe. Do you want to talk more, and we'll show another video? Yeah, because we have like a couple of things that we can show video, and then we can ask some questions. So I just, Great. I think, in, in just to say about our experience here with students, our experience in talking to scientists and and turning that into a show. Well, one thing was that. In that question of metaphors, um, the problem actually becomes that you become overwhelmed with metaphors. Uh, and if anything is trying to, uh, almost every interview we did came up with, I mean, just to think of a few, which was the story of the creation of the Panama Canal, uh, the scientists working on this 100 hectare plot uh, in Barrio Colorado who are almost mapping the world on this tiny little piece of land. Um, that motion sensor camera that you saw, where the amazing thing is they have no proof that there are jaguars on that island except through those photographs, which creates this wonderful thing of what if an animal is there and it's not there. Uh, the idea of being a ship spotter of these people around the world who follow, who sort of are mapping the world through where uh, ships or planes or trains or animals are, of watchers, of uh, bird watchers, of people who are trying to track in a funny way, are mapping the world through being obsessed with one thing that they follow. Um, up in uh, Churchill, of these abandoned Cold War stations that are being turned into scientific research stations, of uh, obviously the melting ice, the polar bears, um, this woman who used to be a ra do radar research during the Cold War up in uh, Canada, and since has started making jam in the greenhouse where she grows has grown a lime tree near the Arctic Circle. Uh, and actually, most spectacularly, was these group of students who we met uh, who worked with Polo, who came to Polar Bear International, and we went out uh, into the tundra with them. And um, following these students and interviewing these students, and then working here with our students, I think was the other real uh, inspiration behind the play. Because in the end, uh, the students became the play, have more and more become the play. The play is about, is really at the center now about kids, uh, or certainly in our play, one kid, but the the watching these students, these amazing students from all over the world who come to 
work on with Polar Bear International, and then here working with students, uh, interdisciplinary undergraduates who were so generous and excited and smart and could ask us really difficult questions. Uh, really inspired then what the play was, because the end of the play is about them. Um, so we have, a, should we do this one more song? Yeah, or, um, yeah, we could, it's a few minutes and then, is that all right? Then we'll have a little time for questions. Um, so this is, this is, yeah, this is the last song of the play. Of the play, and just to say, uh, it was inspired by, uh, we, we interviewed this wonderful uh, woman up in Colorado and we asked the same question of sort of, how do you feel about human extinction? And she said, well, I don't, don't want to be, I don't want to be around at the end. I don't want to be sitting there with my, like with my little blue recycling box all alone, which I thought was just sort of the best, <laughs> best image I'd ever heard of this sort of last person desperately still doing the recycling to know. <laughs> so the song's called The Next Forever. Um, actually, I'll throw two more things in that, but just that, um, yeah, it certainly was one of the refrain, uh, one of the refrains of, of the environmental scientists that we spoke to, which was, you know, really the the reason to care about ch climate change is to care about people. You know, the, the climate changes radically; life will go on the planet in some form, but we might not. So, um, it's not. Um, what did somebody say? It's like it's not just you know be nice and do plants and animals. Um, it's about do you care about human civilization or human beings might continue to exist, but. Uh, what we value of our civilization um, might not. So, and, and the paleontologist, the Colombian paleontologist that we talked to when we asked her, how, what's, what are we dealing with? And he said, well, we're going to be dealing with this for the next. No, that was, that's the mayor of Churchill. Oh, the mayor of Churchill said. I that was my next point. point. Oh, go ahead. This is how we work together. <laughs> <laughs> so we were interviewing the mayor of Churchill. It was the first indigenous mayor of Churchill. Um, who has like four businesses there. And he was like, you know, for you guys, it's an abstraction. But for us, it's... It's you know it's our, it's happening and, and we're going to be dealing with this for the next forever, um, which then became the song that we made into a music video with a sloth um, because it's a sloth.
So yeah, and that's, well, that was all footage that our, um, our filmmaker shot on the island when we were there. Um, so yeah, we have time for, I guess, some questions. Questions? Comments. Complaints. Complaints. I, I grew up with Tom Lehrer from my dad, so... I think in our shows, one thing we've always worked really hard at is that uh, balance between, uh, between dealing with the things that, we're, uh, that we find important or uh, that we really, the information we want to communicate, the stories we want to tell, and at the same time the pleasure principle, uh, both in the, in the humor and the speech, in the, in the talking bits in the non-sung things, in the songs. I think it's one thing the songs can do is you can actually, simultaneously, people can laugh and still find it intriguing. Um, there's a, a, I think because it's already so clearly stylized, but it's certainly, I think, a sort of, I don't say a populist bent, but a bent towards, we want, you have to, you know, you take a step towards the audience and the audience is gonna take a step towards you. Uh, and it doesn't mean you have to dumb down your material. In fact, I think it means you can make your material richer, more complex in the way you're dealing with it, I hope. I would, I would just throw in on that. I do, I do think that there's, I don't know, again, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I think that there's a way that... I thought that, you were a neuroscientist. You've been lying to me for years. Um, <laughs> that, um, that's, that, that story, that the visual elements of the theater, that the, the cleverness of a song or the, or the comedy can, can actually... Uh, in a way, capture your conscious attention, and in a way that opens a door to get into other parts of your the audience's brain. And I believe, like you kind of have to like keep them pleasantly occupied. And there's nothing more amazing than a moment of the laughter that turns into I don't want to say tears, but when laughter goes off a cliff, when you've almost caught people unaware because it's a funny thing, funny, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's really upsetting. Um, and those moments when you watch an audience, when an actor does something that's amusing until the speech goes somewhere different that is really upsetting. And if it had started with tragedy, you, you run the risk of exhausting people. There's something about the sort of ability of laughter to then catch them unawares with how complicated or upsetting or tragic or frightening something is that I, I find when we can pull that off in a show is the most rewarding of watching an audience laugh and then gasp or that kind of thing. Thank you so much for this. It's really, really powerful. Um, I'm just curious, you said you had to do, because you were from the INSF, you had to do a lot of monitoring. So I'm just curious to know what feedback you received from your audiences, um, from the students and the fairs and all the educational things you've done associated with this. Has it, has it changed, if at all, their perspective? Um, it has. The, I mean, we actually have a, we have a, a, a sort of long and detailed report that, that synthesizes all of the um, quantitative measures that the evaluator did in Kansas City, but because I'm still working, we're still working on the show and revising it, I'm, I'm not reading it. Um, I've scanned it a little bit, but you know, as soon as you see one thing that says, what percentage of the audience found it tedious and boring? Who <laughs> thought it was engaging and exciting? And, um, I kind yeah, of yeah, it's like reading your, you don't want to read your reviews till the play is done. So. Um, and it also just messes with my head if I actually if I think about that too much. Um, so we'll get back and, to you on that. But, but we do talk to we talk to um, we, you know we have lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and we do talkbacks and we get um, lots of lots of feedback um, from 
you know, from scientists who've been involved with this as we've done it, from um, all sorts of different kind of constituencies. And uh, I think the, well, one of the most striking things is I, I, that I've heard, which I think is our objective, is that people feel like that the issues are real to them after seeing the play. That, in a sense, what I was going for, what I was, when I was talking about the, um, the story, that, that, the, that the abstract, at least for this period of time, becomes visceral and concrete. Uh, that they engage with the subject, in a, I think, certainly in a different way than allows them, I think, to engage, from what we've heard, as they say. Yeah, that's, that's uh, and on, and on sort of the other polls, I think we, you know, when we've talked to scientists, um, and maybe they're just being nice, but it's been pretty universally positive. Uh, when we did it here at Princeton, I remember one scientist who said, it's so nice to see a play in which the scientists are not evil masterminds, you know. Um, and I think at the other end of the spectrum, you know, some, uh, some response play is like, well, it just, it really seems like, yeah, it seems like science, or there's, there's too much information in it, um, and I wish it was more of a play, you know, and we haven't found that balance yet, and I think for some people that balance is really taking all science and information out of the play, which we're probably not going to do, um, but it is, it is something that is, uh, that is, Jarring, like as I as I said, like these these this whole realm of human experience generally is not considered in the theater. So, uh, what's the overall impact that you're trying to get a message to have on the audience? I'd say it's some combination of, of all of those. I, um, and I'm glad you brought up the third one because, like I said, you know, we have to have everything quantified and evaluate your impact. And, and you know, what an evaluator can do is, you know, what was the impact on the person who came in and watched the play? Um, and what do they think differently? But you know, even you know, even as our and our play is still imperfect. Like we're still figuring it out. It's been very, very, very hard. Um, it's getting better. But I actually think one of the biggest impacts is just the fact that we're doing it, um, and because of the money, which is a blessing and a curse, it's gotten a lot of visibility, and uh, and we've been in lots of different discussions. We, we do this, we go back and forth on this bridge from science world to culture world and talk about this stuff. And uh, I think, I think it, you know, looking back at this, whatever, a few years from now, that the, in a way, the, the most significant impact is that we sort of have walked out on this ledge and tried to figure out how to make theater there. And that means somebody else is going to go over and explore this terrain and somebody else is going to do it and we're, you know, starting, starting the, the, pro uh, the process, really. Um, one more question. Have you thought of doing a play involving, involving the necessity for migration? say from uh, low lying uh, areas, cities right near the, the sea, like, like New York City. What if New York City, what if the engineers couldn't solve the problem of uh, uh, water rise around New York City? How about the prospect of New York City having to migrate? Um, that's a good idea. Yeah, you should write that play. <laughs> um, there, is a, there is a movie, I don't know if you've, if you've seen it. Um, God, what is that called? It's like Earth. Wrong. Or, yeah, where they have an ed and they have a, like a sort of guy who talks, and then they have this animated movie that follows you a hundred years into the future, and the barricades are put up outside of New York, and then they break, and you watch 
you watch. I mean, for me, I don't know. Now I bring this up; it's interesting. But the, for me, the in watching all these environmental movies and documentaries, um, and part of what fed my despair and anxiety was watching all this stuff, um, because like that one, you 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 know, you spend about ninety percent uh, of the of the film or the book um, getting into how dire it is how deeply entrenched the problems are to get to the point of absolute desperation. And then in the last 10 minutes, they come on with the like, if we can all radically transform the way that we live politically, socially, economically, on a personal level, public level, and, and, and facilitate profound international collaboration, we can beat this. And then you think, well, the hell, that's not going to happen. And then you're really, really depressed. So. <laughs> actually are doing in the fall a play of civilians at uh, Paris Horizons in New York, a play which deals specifically with um, a group of people after a large-scale environmental disaster that has caused people to leave all sorts of cities and move, uh, uh, sort of ch change where they live, and who then attempt to put on theater, and what, in a funny way, what the culture of the future would be after such an event. So in fact, the, the play you're describing is in many ways the play we will be doing. Yes. Someone, someone else wrote it. I get to end with a pitch. 